Hello writers! Whether you're doing NaNoWriMo, editing your newest project, or just desperately trying to keep up with your TBR pile, it's hard to find the time to plan and cook healthy and nutritious meals to keep you energized on these jam-packed days. So I'm here to tell you about Factor, America's number one ready-to-eat meal delivery service. They can help you fuel up fast for breakfast, lunch, and dinner with chef-prepared, dietitian approved ready-to-eat meals delivered straight to your door. You'll save time, eat well, and stay on track with one less excuse to keep you from writing. This November, get Factor and enjoy eating well without the hassle. Simply choose your meals and enjoy fresh, flavor-packed deliveries right to your door. Ready in just two minutes, no prep and no mess. Head to factormeals.com WX50 and use code WX50 to get 50% off. That's code WX50 at factormeals.com WX50 to get 50% off. This episode of Writing Excuses has been brought to you by our listeners, patrons, and friends. If you would like to learn how to support this podcast, visit www.patreon.com slash writing excuses. Season 18, Episode 47. This is Writing Excuses. NaNoWriMo, Week 4, the three-quarter mark, making the turn from opening to closing. Fifteen minutes long. Because you're in a hurry. And we're not that smart. I'm Mary Robinette. I'm Don Juan. I'm Aaron. And I'm Dan. And today we're going to talk about as we move from the opening part, the gallop away of writing through NaNoWriMo to the end, which is near. But my question for you all is, what is the difference between the way that you write when you're starting something and the way that you write when you're ending something? Because we're going to be transitioning between these two What are we even transitioning between? So this is a thing that it took me forever to figure out why I always bogged down at the three-quarter mark. And, And I think it's because you're switching modes. So for me, what I find is that at the beginning, I am opening questions, I'm throwing out possibilities, I'm making things worse, I'm introducing new problems. And at the end, I have to start solving problems and wrapping things up. And And it's like the difference between... You know, when you arrive on vacation and you've got a bag and you just open it and you pull your stuff out, and then when it's time to go home and you have to somehow get everything back into the suitcase, and it never goes back into the suitcase the way you think it's going to, but also you don't want to because you you just want to keep pulling things out. So for me, it's it's the difference between asking questions in, in a general sense and answering them. That makes sense, but it almost sounds like it's the anticipation of that ending Mm -hmm. part. So, like, it's not the last, you're not throwing the things in the suitcase yet, but you're figuring out what you're going to wear the day before the last day, and you're like, oh, gosh, there's stuff all over this hotel room or this (laughs) cruise cabin, and at some point I'm going to have to do it, and it can almost make you not enjoy Mm -hmm. the thing that you're doing right now as you're, like, thinking ahead to what's coming. One of my favorite stories about writing is an interview Neil Gaiman gave when he was writing. I think it was Coraline. It might have been Graveyard Book. Uh, And he said that uh, he hit this point in the book where he just hated everything. The book was not working. The characters didn't work. The story was terrible. He called his agent and he said, I'm sorry, I don't think I can write this. It's awful. And she laughed and said, oh, you're at the three-quarter mark, aren't you? (laughs) You call me every single time and give me the same thing. Keep going. You'll be fine. And a lot of it is just our tendency to get inside of our own heads and to think, you know, I'm almost to the end of this tightrope. Of course, I'm going to fall off these last few feet. Uh, no, you're not. You're doing great. Um, it, we, we have to, like Mary Robinette said, start answering questions instead of asking them. Asking questions is so easy. Because we can ask anything we want, and that's a problem for future Dan. Uh, but <laughs> oh, then when you're t- future Dan. <laughs> no, I'm future Dan. And some jerk asked a bunch of questions, and I have to find not only answers, but good answers that make sense and pull all the threads together that I've been carefully laying out and make them into this beautiful, beautiful perfect ending. And it can be incredibly overwhelming, even if it isn't actually difficult. It's just... It looks like it's going to be so hard. I can't tell you how many times I've had that exact same phone call where I've told my writers, it's okay. You're most of the way through a book. You're two-thirds, you're three-quarters, and 
it just feels not great sometimes when you're there. And I do think it's really interesting to hear from your perspectives why that is, that making this turn from rising action where you get to be introducing things and now you start having to answer the questions that you've asked, right? So I guess my question for you guys is how do you start answering those, right? Like how do you start bringing people moving away from each other and having to have them re-intersect, having your villains and your your heroes, your antagonists, you know, romantic interests, whatever it is, start actually reaching the points that they're on their collision paths and start colliding. And I, I think that's a great question. And But actually, even before that, uh, just to uh, kill this metaphor of the, the vacation, <laughs> is that there's something nice about like you've got the outfit that you feel really great in for that particular day. And it's that you want to find something that you can treat yourself with in the this part of the book. Like mm-hmm. there's something at the three quarter mark that you get to do, which is that the big, huge explosions, whatever those are, whether they're literal explosions or emotional explosions, like those get to happen at this moment. Uh, there's a person that I know calls them candy bar scenes, the scenes that you're mm. sort of waiting for that are mm. rewarding yourself. And so if you think, yes, I do have to bring everything back together, but also this is the part where I get to open and eat this candy. It's a way to keep yourself excited while you answer that question of how you're going to pull everything back together. I think that's a great idea. And I I have talked before about how there are are scenes that I've been waiting to get to, like just eager to write. One of the tricks that I use is is that I shift the way that I'm handling tri-fail cycles. So up uh, up to about this point, I have been doing the yes, they succeed, but something goes wrong. Um, So if you think about yes as a progress towards a goal and no as progress away from a goal, reversals, but you you think about and, you think about and as a continuation of motion and but as a reversal. So I switch from going yes but to yes and. So I start giving my characters Mm. bonus actions like... (laughs) Um, you know, we're trying to uh, to break into this safe. Uh, does it work? Yes. And there's also this other piece of secret information in the safe that we weren't expecting to find. So I'll give them bonus actions. And with the no, it's like, are we able, if instead I'd been like, are we able to get into the safe? No. But in the process of doing that, we accidentally set off the alarms which is now preventing the cops from getting to us. So we have extra time. So, you know, like that, giving them that tiny bonus action, I start mm-hmm. sprinkling those in. So when I'm starting to move to the end and I can can kind of feel story bloat happening, I will look at it and like, okay, how can you give them success in a little bit of a bonus action? And mm-hmm. if I want to keep the tension going, then I give them no, and then a little bit of a bonus action. Mm-hmm. I love this idea of candy bar scenes, and this plays really well into what you're saying in terms of switching from, uh, you know, one model to the yes and. And because there should be joy as you're heading into the climax. There should be emotional resolution, right? Um, I was thinking about the uh, Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, right? Where before you get to the big climactic battle, there are all these, like, incredibly heartfelt emotional scenes that lead to this incredible one of the most triumphant scenes I've ever seen in cinema when Miles like finally owns his own power and does that incredible jump off the building. That's such an iconic shot. And it's like you have these incredible emotional highs in that that come from getting to have the the candy bar the, of his dad telling him that he loves him and he's proud of him and all these things, of him believing in himself. And like we've been going through it with him for so long and so hungry for that that by the time we get that treat – it is a whole feast and um, it, it's such a powerful moment. So I think when you're thinking about how to go into, we, we started by talking about why this is also hard. This doesn't make it easy necessarily, but I love this idea of framing it as a treat for you, the writer, a treat for the character and a treat for the audience. This is the reward we've been hanging out for this entire time. It always helps me to remember that so many writers are also bad at this. <laughs> yes. like, and we talk so much about movies. How many action movies have you seen that have two acts, hour and a half, whatever, of brilliant dialogue and funny stuff, and then act three is just a gunfight or a chase scene, and then it ends, mm-hmm. right? Like, most of the Marvel movies are this way. Mm-hmm. 
incredibly interesting questions in uh, Winter Soldier about the, the where's the line between uh, safety and security? How far can we push this? What are we going to do? What's the answer to this question? And at the end, the movie doesn't answer that question. It just has a big fight scene. Um, but then, you know, one of the ones where they did it really well was in Endgame, where, yes, the third act is a giant fight scene, but it is filled with those candy bar scenes, those character moments. That's when we get on your left and all the people show up. That's when we get Avengers Assemble that we've been waiting 23 movies for. That's when we get all these little heroic stand-up and cheer moments. So it's not just a fight scene. It's more than that. And at this moment, we're going to take a break. And when we come back, more candy. NaNoWriMo is just around the corner, and it's time to start planning. If you're aiming for 1,600 words a day, it's easy to deprioritize eating, but you need to keep the brain fueled. During NaNo, I turn to meal kits. HelloFresh makes whipping up a home-cooked meal a nice break from writing with quick and easy options, including their 15-minute meals. With everything pre-proportioned and delivered right to your door every week, it takes way less time than it takes to get a delivery. I find that stepping away from the keyboard to cook gives my brain time to rest. I love that with HelloFresh, I can plan my meals for the month before NaNoWriMo begins, and then I can save all my decision-making for the stories. With so many in-season ingredients, you'll taste all the freshness of fall in every bite of HelloFresh chef-crafted recipes. Produce travels from the farm to your door for peak ripeness you can taste. Go to HelloFresh.com slash 50WX and use the code 50WX for 50% off, plus free shipping. Yeah, that's right. 50WX50 50 for 50% off and WX for writing excuses. We are terrible with puns. Just visit HelloFresh.com slash 50WX and try America's number one meal kit. Hey, writers, you're doing a hard and difficult thing. And I'm sure at this point, it feels like you've been doing it forever and will be doing it forever. That said, I'm not here to tell you it gets better. I'm here to tell you that you can survive this. Doing hard things is hard, and that's okay. Making art should be hard, especially in the middle of it when you're past the initial rush of starting and you can't yet see the finish line. It's like walking a very long way. When you're doing something like that, I think a lot about the mile markers. For me, they're a blessing and a curse. They remind me of how far I've come and how far I have to go. And for me, surviving any kind of endurance activity requires focusing on the present moment, thinking about the next step that's in front of me and putting out of my mind how far away the end is. So, Sometimes I try to ignore the mile markers, to refuse to acknowledge how long I've been walking and how long I will be walking. But the problem with that is it means I forget to have joy in the process. I forget that the mile marker means I've accomplished something great. I walked another mile. I took another step. And if the answer is to be truly present in the moment, that also means honoring what it means to have made it this far. So I'm asking you now, to stay in the moment. I want you to celebrate today's word count. Don't focus on the total. Focus on the accomplishment. Focus on what you've done. I know it's hard. I know it's long. But you've come this far, and I'm so proud of you for doing so. You've got this. Keep taking that next step. Keep putting the next word down and keep going. I'll see you at the end. All right, so we are back from our break. And I actually wanted to answer, sort of answer a little more the question, uh, Dongwon, that you asked earlier uh, before we got distracted, uh, which was how do you actually start bringing things back in? Mm -hmm. So you're treating yourself, but you can't treat yourself so much that you forget the story that you're telling. And I think one way actually is to be more explicit about 
the questions that you're asking. Because I think what happens in those action movies, Dan, that you were talking about is that sometimes the story gets so excited by the treats that it forgets the the questions that it set up in the first half and actually doesn't think to answer them because there's so much like, oh, I've got to do this or I've got to get to the ending. But you forget that you left out these questions about safety and security or these bigger thematic issues. So I'm curious, how do you keep track of like, the promises that you made at the beginning and sort of how to make sure that you're keeping track of them as you move towards the end. I mean, this is why I, I lean on the mice quotient so much because uh, because it, you know, usually there's a fairly clear questiony kind of thing at the beginning. And so, like, I, I often describe this this area of the book as as one of the places where the character has to face an impossible choice um, between their goal and a failure state or or between you know, which goal they're, they're willing to, to sacrifice in order to attain the other. So, like, if they're afraid of heights, they're absolutely going to have to go out on a ledge right now. And so I will often look back at what I have at the front of the book. And part of my mechanical process, which is harder during nano, but I will often pause at the three-quarter point and read through what I've already written and then keep going with the pieces that I'm excited about knowing that some of the stuff that I've written I'm going to discard because it's less exciting to me. Um, so it's it's less candy. But for me, those are some things. The other thing for me, mechanically, is something that Dan taught me, which is the seven-point plot structure. And this is the point where I'm going to look at Dan meaningfully. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I was excited for you to just talk about how smart I am for a while. No. Well, so, yeah, the, the seven-point plot structure is specifically, there's, there's the point where at, right around in here, uh, the hero finally has all of the tools that they need in order to, to, to solve the problem. And so recognizing, it's like, oh, this is something that I can do on purpose. I can I can look for what does my what does my main character need? What are the problems? What is the goal and the failure state? They're going to have to make that impossible choice and then like what tools we're coming up on that impossible choice. What tools do I need to have in their hand so that when they get to that choice they can make it. Yeah, I love to think of these choices specifically as like kind of concentric circles of nested problems. And the the example that leaps to mind is uh, The Nice Guys. That's probably my favorite detective <laughs> movie ever. Um, and so we start with this kind of outside problem. Here's a weird mystery. We need to solve it. And then we introduce, here's this detective who's an absolute mess and his daughter doesn't respect him. And then we introduce, here's this other detective who the daughter thinks is probably a bad guy. And then we're going to resolve those in opposite order. And in the final fight scene, we get uh, Mr. Haley or Holly or whatever his name is. If you kill that man, I will never speak to you again. And of course, at this point in the movie, that means something coming Mm -hmm. from this 12-year-old girl. We love her. She's the best character in the story. And so he leaves the person alive. And we get, we've tied off that inner circle. He, He has proved himself a good person to this girl. And then we tie off the next one. Uh, Ryan Gosling succeeds. He saves the day. He doesn't screw up for the first time in his life. And his daughter smiles at him. Okay, we've got that respect. And then at the very end, we tie off the whole thing. We've solved the mystery. We know what's going on. And so if you think about it in those terms of there's not just one conflict, there's several, you can nest them like that and then solve them in reverse order. And that gives your ending a lot of structure that you might not have known was already there. This really ties into the, one of the things we were talking about last week uh, when we were discussing raising the stakes, which is introducing multiple threads of stakes, right? And this gives you the opportunity to build to your, you know, keep increasing the tension and ratchet things up, even though you're closing things off. Because if you do have those nested stakes, if you do have that multiple threads, you know, your heroes can defeat a mini boss, have an emotional resolution. The big conflict is still coming. The last sort of act of this is still playing out, but you have these beats to give you those candy scenes, to give you those points of resolution. And the more you have those little things closing off, that is a signal to your audience that, okay, we are in, we are in the Daniel, not Daniel Mont, but we're making the turn here, right? We're in the three-quarter mark of we're moving towards the the big climax here. 
And so giving people those little signals can be a great way to build tension as well. And this can be difficult, definitely all of this during nano, because you're just, you're moving at a pace. You know, you're you're going, you know, really quickly. But one thing that I like uh, doing, like during a nano project, is actually writing myself notes about what threads might be or what mm-hmm. the concentric circles might be as I'm going. So like at the end of a day, I might write like one note of like the coolest thing that I randomly wrote that day. Like I'll be like, his dad's a spider. Like, and like, <laughs> you know, like maybe that doesn't come up again because I forget about it. But then when I get to that three quarter mark, I can't do the thing Mary Robinette was talking about where you read the whole book, but I can read back a page of very slightly incoherent notes and be like, oh yeah, his dad is a spider. This is a chance for me to like make that kind of come back. Aaron, I'm not <laughs> sure about the Spider-Man reboot. I know I'll fuck in the other one, but this one might be a little tough for me. I'm, I'm hoping this is part of the the house is full of bees. <laughs> it is. That's why it's so traumatic for him. <laughs> So I do a, a very similar thing during Nano because, uh, you know, as you say, I do not have time to read through the whole thing at this point. But I, all through the process, I am leaving notes to myself in square brackets. And uh, so I will, at this point, just look for any note that I have left for myself to see, like, what great idea I had earlier that I had totally forgotten about by I get by the time I get to this. Because you've probably you've probably left something to yourself a note someplace, and it doesn't make any sense, and that's okay. You can still like try to fold it in here. Yeah, even if you haven't left a note to yourself, a lot of times people work collaboratively during Nano. So if you have any friends that you're working with in your writing group, you can ask them, is there something I was mentioning like two weeks ago that you you haven't heard me say anything about recently? And they'll be like, yes, it was the Spider Dad. And you're like, yes, Yes. the time is now. That's what it was. Spider Dad and the bees. (laughs) (laughs) That's one of the reasons I find writing groups so useful is because if there's something you've forgotten about, they haven't. Because you have asked this intriguing question and they really want to know the answer to it. And they'll be like, why haven't we ever gotten back to his dad being a spider? And like, oh, yes. Don't like, worry. I have some really cool plans. <laughs> <laughs> and again, all the things we're talking about are big structural tools, right? And, you know, these are stuff that will be as useful to you in editing and in drafting when maybe you aren't trying to hit this in- insane deadline every week of getting certain words out. But hopefully all of this is at least giving you some framework and some way to think about, okay, how am I approaching this week of work, right? Now that we're in week four, how am I thinking about the words I'm going to get down on the page? One of the other things that you can do, particularly as a, a nano thing and, and if you're discovery writing, you remember way back when we were talking about objective and super objective, one of the things that will happen to a character is that their goals will shift as, their, as they change. So you can look at it now and say, what new goal does my character have based on their new understanding of who they are? Because and, and like it still needs to be tied to that super objective and to that those initial opening questions but like what is what is their new solution and that will often help you get towards the 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 final climactic battle because uh because the new solution is an easier thing to solve or the new their new like oh this is what i can do their new goal is an easier thing to solve than whatever thing they have been continually failing at right This sounds like a great point to get some homework. Yeah. So this is a trick that I picked up from Dan, um, which is read through what you wrote the session before. Not the day, uh, not everything, but just the session. So if you wrote for 10 minutes, that's all you get to reread. And you can make minor edits if you're adding words, uh, but you can't cut anything because it's nano and every word counts. Use brackets to make notes to yourself about stuff you want to go back and plant earlier, things that you are going to need for your character to solve what's coming up. But you don't have to actually go back and do that right now. You're just going to use this as a launching pad to move on. This has been Writing Excuses. You're out of excuses. Now go write. Do you have a book or a short story that you need help with? We're now offering an interactive tier on Patreon called Office Hours, Once a month, you can join a group of your peers and the hosts of Writing Excuses to ask questions. Writing Excuses has been brought to you by our listeners, patrons, and friends. 
For this episode, your hosts were Mary Robinette Kowal, Dong Wan Song, Aaron Roberts, and Howard Taylor. This episode was engineered by Marshall Carr Jr., mastered by Alex Jackson, and produced by Emma Reynolds. For more information, visit writingexcuses.com.